Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. So today I'm gonna to be telling you about something super, super interesting that I've been fascinated in for years. Now, it is something that a lot of people don't know that much about or they think they know about it or just know a little bit about it and they really don't know what's truly going on. And that is the world of Scientology. Scientology, one of the strangest religions. Some people call it a cult. I have done a full podcast on Scientology that I'll link below if you wanna check it out. Um, but I thought I would do a video here as well, kind of a quicker rundown of this bizarre religion. But before we get started, I'd like to thank Audible for sponsoring this video. Now, I know you guys have heard me talk about Audible so many times, and that is because I really like to work with brands that I actually like, and Audible is something that I truly, truly love. I have been using audiobooks forever because I have dyslexia and reading is <laughs> a nightmare. So listening to a book gives me a much better experience. I really like to listen to Audible because they're read by people who are making it an entertaining thing to listen to, like it's theatrical. You can read so much faster, it's so convenient. You can listen wherever you are on your phone, on your computer, anything like that. You can listen in the car, on an airplane, on a train, on a bus, on a camel. And today I wanted to recommend a book for you specifically about Scientology written by the wonderful Lee Remini who has done amazing work for victims of this religion and the book is called Troublemaker Surviving Hollywood and Scientology and it would blow your mind if you've not seen her show I mean her entire experience is really really crazy and all the people she's come across and the things that she's learned by going through this experience is just insane I love her she's such a real person and the audible book is a really great enjoyable experience so definitely check it out and you can actually get your first audiobook free with a 30-day free trial all you have to do is visit audible.com slash Kendall Ray or text Kendall Ray to 500 500 and we'll get you set up that way. Again, that is www.audible.com slash Kendall Ray, K-E-N-D-A-L-L-R-A-E or text Kendall Ray to 500 500. There's so many options on there, you guys. It is truly endless. If you're watching this channel, you're probably into like crime and conspiracy and interesting stuff like that. And Audible has plenty of stuff on that as well. All right, so many of you are probably asking, what is Scientology exactly? Well, Scientology is actually taken from the word sio, which is a Latin word and it means knowing. And they also mix that with a Greek word logos, which means study of. So it literally means knowing how to know. Now Scientology was developed by this man. His name is L. Ron Hubbard. And according to him, Scientology is a religion that offers a precise path to leading a complete and certain understanding of one's true spiritual nature and one's relationship to self, family, groups, man, mankind, all life forms, the material universe, the spirit universe, and the supreme being. So it's a tall order there. In Scientology, there is a core central belief that 75 million years ago, 13.5 trillion aliens were banished to Earth by a warlord named Xenu. And then these exiled aliens on Earth were dropped into volcanoes and vaporized with nuclear bombs. Now, since these aliens have turned into like souls and Scientologists call them Thetans. And they think that these Thetans have essentially attached their soul onto a human soul. So we are all attached to these Thetans. And they basically believe that these Thetans are the cause of our sin, our trouble, our misfortune. And Scientologists basically believe that to ease one's like unconscious side, like your soul, a person must take part in something called audits. And you do these audits with a trained Scientology counselor. And basically by taking part in these like training and counseling sessions, you're kind of like rising up in your enlightenment, your knowledge, your seniority, and kind of moving up a grading system in the Scientology system. So let me tell you a little bit more about L. Ron Hubbard because he is quite a fascinating dude. So the biographies of L. Ron Hubbard portray him as this legendary man in all stages of his life from a youthful prodigy to a teenage adventurer to a brave war hero and then a long-suffering messiah who gave his life for all. Now what's crazy is when you learn the truth about him, almost every single fact in his biographies is a lie. Literally, the official biography begins with with Lafayette Ronald Hubbard was born in Tilden, Nebraska on March 13th, 
1911. His father was Commander Harry Ross Hubbard of the United States Navy, and his mother was Dora May Hubbard. Now, so far, that part is true, but then he starts to stretch the truth. Ron claims that in his childhood, he spent a lot of time on his grandfather's cattle ranch in Montana. And according to him, it was so big that it covered like a quarter of the state of Montana. Montana. And he said that when living on this ranch, he actually ended up learning how to read and write by only age three years old. However, we find out later on that his grandfather did not even own a cattle ranch. He was actually like a small town veterinarian, but he did live in Helena, Montana, and his father was actually hired to manage like a local theater in the area. And he lived in like a small apartment with his parents. He had a pretty normal childhood. He attended the local school. When he was six years old, his father actually did enroll in the Navy for the First World War. And for years after that, he ended up going around with his mom to all the different port cities that his dad was being, you know, sent to. But Ron had a real interest in like religion and philosophy. And by the time he was 12 years old, he really started to have a lot of questions about things, was wondering about how the world works. So according to his biography from 1925 to 1929, he was like a world adventurer. According to him, he went all over Asia especially up and down China. However, the truth is a bit different. At the age of 13, the Hubbards had actually moved to Burmerton, Washington, where Ron was a student at Union High School. Two years later, when Ron was a sophomore at Queen Anne High School, his father was unexpectedly posted to Guam. And this is where Ron actually spent most of his summer sailing with his mother on the steamship President Madison with stops in Honolulu, Yokohama, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Manila. So yes, he traveled Asia, but not in the way that he described. In the spring of his junior year, he dropped out of school. Two years later, Ron was enrolled in the Woodward School for Boys in Washington, DC as a substitute for taking the college entrance examination. In 1930, Ron was admitted to George Washington University School of Engineering and majored in civil engineering. But for the first semester, his grades really weren't that great and he ended up failing multiple classes. After a second and similar semester, he ended up dropping out of school completely. He ended up saying that he had as a PhD. But later on, he did admit that he in fact bought the degree. But L. Ron Hubbard actually started a career out in creative writing. He would write pulp fiction stories. And he ended up getting married to Margaret Polly Grubb in 1933. And in 1941, as the United States was going into the Second World War, he decided that he was going to join the Navy and he was very determined to do this. He is such a liar that he even wrote a fake recommendation letter for his himself for the military, and this is what it said. I have known him for many years, and I have found him discreet, loyal, honest, and without peer in the art of things done swiftly. For courage and ability, I cannot too strongly recommend him. So he ended up getting accepted to the Navy, and his first job was a desk job in public relations. Eventually, he requested a transfer to Navy intelligence, and Ron always described his time in the military as really amazing, that he was really well-regarded and looked up to and, and just an awesome part of the Navy. He believed that he was like superior to everyone else there, but his supervisors did not agree and they actually had this written up on him on record. This officer is not satisfactory for independent duty assignment. He is garrulous and tries to give impressions of his importance. He seems to think he has unusual ability in most lines. These characteristics indicate that he will require close supervision from satisfactory performance of any intelligence duty. And the report also added that he'd become the source of much trouble. So he was eventually given another desk job, but this didn't work out either. And he eventually worked himself into the Submarine Chaser Training Center in Miami, Florida. However, he wasn't good at this job either. And he made a lot of mistakes when it came to training ships under his command. And this is when another entry was put on his record. And it said this, consider this officer lacking in the essential qualities of judgment, leadership, and cooperation. He acts without forethought as to probable results. He is not considered qualified for command or promotion at this time. Recommend duty on a large vessel where he can be properly supervised. And that is when he was later
later posted onto the USS Algol. Now, one time as this ship was about to go into battle, L. Ron Hubbard somehow found a Coke bottle, like a homemade gasoline Coke bottle bomb in all of the luggage that was being loaded onto the ship, into the cargo. This was a very strange finding and people didn't know if he actually found it there or if maybe he put it there. Now, what actually happened during this incident was not recorded, but L. Ron Hubbard was relieved of his duty after that. Soon after this though, he reported in sick with a suspected ulcer and he was hospitalized at the Oak Knoll Military Hospital in Oakland, California, where he remained until December 5th of 1945 when he was formally discharged from the Navy. Now, his own reporting of himself and his story states that he was this amazing military person who won all these awards and medals and he really didn't at all. He actually said that he received 21 war medals when in reality he only received four medals that were routinely given to everyone that was part of the war. So at this time in his life, he actually did have two children and a wife. He was discharged from the Navy and you'd think that he would head home to them? Nah. This is when he decided to head directly for a house in Pasadena, California, where there was supposed to be a large group of people, including this guy named Jack Parsons, who was the leader of a supernatural religious organization called the Ordo Templis Orientis. So he actually ended up meeting this guy, Jack, and the two of them ended up collabing, an old fashioned collab, on something that they called the Babylon Working, which was this like magic, sexual ritual intended to summon the incarnation of Babylon, the supreme Thelemite goddess. So that was an interesting period. Also in the late 1940s, he ended up practicing as a hypnotist and he was also working in Hollywood posing as a Swami, which is a Hindu religious teacher. And according to Scientology now, L. Ron Hubbard's work doing this and his experience with hypnosis led him to create something called Dianetics. This is L. Ron Hubbard's book. It's called Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health. And it basically takes the different aspects of hypnosis, Buddhist concepts, and elements of other philosophies and practices and brings them together. And the book came out in 1950. So a lot of people believe that at this time, L. Ron Hubbard was getting into some like Satanism type stuff, some black magic. He was really interested in magic. His mentor, in fact, was the infamous English black magician, Aleister Crowley. Crowley has all these different books that are on these types of things, such as the Book of Law. So many of Crowley's beliefs about black magic have been included into Scientology, specifically into something called OT levels, which is kind of like that grading up system that I was explaining earlier. Now, one more thing you should probably know about L. Ron Hubbard is according to his son, the dude was doing all types of drugs at this time and pretty serious stuff. Like he was tripping, like doing peyote and hallucinogens. Okay, sorry, my camera battery died. I I had to recharge it and then my hair was driving me insane. I feel like I look like Shirley Temple. So yes, I put it in a ponytail. But here we are, we're back. Where were we? So the Church of Scientology actually started in 1950, right after the Dianetics book was released and my dogs are barking, excellent. Basically, according to Dianetic theory in the book, the mind is apparently composed of a bunch of mental images of a person's life, basically like actual memories. And if you have negative memories, he refers to them as engrams. And basically in the theory of Dianetics, you have to relive these experiences, kind of like trauma therapy, like go through them with an auditor and basically clear yourself of these engrams. And if you become a person who has all of their engrams or negative shit cleared, you in fact, as a person become clear. So basically the entire purpose of Scientology is to have people slowly cleared of their engrams through audits and Dianetic processing to eventually lead to a completely clear planet. If we clear every single person of their shit, the whole planet can be clear and move on because we are a bunch of basically ruined souls who are attached to these thetans, these banished horrible aliens. <laughs> I know this sounds like some whack stuff. I bet you had no idea how weird Scientology actually was. And in 1954, L. Ron actually had a discovery about how to exactly become completely clear. He realized that you have to clear yourself of not only, you know, the pain and memories and bullshit you've been through in your own life, you also have to do that for all of your past lives. That's right, friends. <laughs> a auditor, a person who is sitting on the other side of a auditing machine in Scientology will tell you 
what happened to you in your past lives and what kinds of things that you did wrong and you have to like go through all these recall processes to remember what you did and clear yourselves of the mistakes or the pain or whatever it is you're hanging on to. And when Elrond brought the whole past lives thing into it, he decided to make Scientology a religion. So basically Scientologists do believe in reincarnation. It's just different than the classic, you know, reincarnation that most of us kind of are familiar with. According to Scientology, a person is kind of like a soul, an invisible entity. And since you're like part alien, you're like connected to these aliens, once you start to clear yourself of all of your engrams, the Thetan starts to restore its godlike powers such as telepathy, telekinesis, the ability to move things with your mind, like Matilda style. The belief in Scientology is that at one point we were all godlike and along the way we just fucked up and now we're making up for it. So you're basically promised that through Scientology, through auditing and counseling, you can regain godlike abilities that you have at your very depths. Tall order. So this is church, church, church Scientology policy. Okay, great, okay. great. And everything's written in Scientology. You have to follow it exactly. So if you become completely cleared and like restored to the original Thetan self, you become an OT or an operating Thetan. Now, what a lot of people don't know about Scientology is how much people spend. It is a huge financial commitment. Sometimes the fees to become an OT are up to like a thousand dollars per hour. In Scientology, they refer to death as dropping the body. And this is very, very strange and kind of confusing, but basically they believe that Thetan or your spirit or your person, whatever you want to call it, is like programmed to, after you die, return to an implant station in outer space. And at this implant station, the Thetan goes through like basically brainwashing. They erase all of your memories from this life, and then they send the Thetan back to Earth to pick up another body and start another life. But Scientology promises that with auditing, which is what I've been talking about this whole time, it's basically really, really expensive training and counseling. People spend mad money on this. And if you go through this training, a person is supposedly able to erase this like return command so that they don't ever have to return to the implant station. At this point, apparently you will be a free being able to pick up bodies as you want to. So how did this actually gain so many people? How did so many people end up in this religion? It is huge. How was the whole religion formed? Like, how did you do this? So when you're in Scientology, you're essentially like a patient of Dianetics. You're going to tell them all types of things that you've been through, if you've been through stuff. People who have really bad emotional damage, all of that stuff is written down and kept on file. Ron was basically presenting Dianetics as a form of mental health therapy. He said that it was scientifically based and created through careful research, but the American Medical Association and the American Psychological Association oppose Dianetics. Ron ended up creating the Hubbard Dianetic Research Foundation to promote his theories and techniques, and auditors would ask people repeatedly to recall things, and under the pressure, probably, people started recalling things from their past lives. And after this, another book came out called The Science of Survival. However, the Hubbard Foundation began to collapse after its initial Dianetics craze wore off. He actually had all these issues with it because he was really starting to put an emphasis on the past life stuff and reincarnation and the investors that were investing in Dianetics didn't like that and he lost control of Dianetics in 1952. But this is when Scientology was really born. So eventually Elrond became interested in this type of lie detector called electropsychometer and he believed that this would yield better results in auditing. He ended up obtaining this device and renamed it the E-meter. And this is what is referred to in Scientology when you are being audited. Like I mentioned earlier, it's like a machine. And basically this device can see through to the human soul. Now the E-meter is basically like a lie detector essentially. You hold the cans, metal cans, it sends like a watch battery type of bolt through your body. And it's basically like a skin, it's not dangerous, right? oh. but it's just like a skin response meter. So like by like your grip and by your sweat and by like different things, it's able to pick up like the electrical current or the electrical flow. Uh -huh. And it can tell 
essentially, just like a police polygraph. Yeah. It's basically like being on a police polygraph meter. In April of 1953, he officially decided that Scientology would start being transformed into a religion. And he outlined plans to start a bunch of spiritual guidance centers that would be charging customers $500 for 20 hours of auditing. And then on February 18th of 1954, incorporation papers were filed in Los Angeles for the Church of Scientology California, which was the first official Scientologist or organization. And the movement quickly spread all through the United States to other English speaking countries such as Britain, Ireland, South Africa, Australia, etc. It was becoming worldwide. And Hubbard himself was the head of the Church of Scientology in its early years. But in 1906, he ended up retiring so that he could develop post clear operating Thetan levels. And this is about the time that he set up something called the Sea Org, which was very similar to the Navy. I mean, he was clearly inspired by it. And these were basically big sea vessels that were filled with servicemen, Scientology servicemen. And eventually the Sea Org became kind of like the elite area of Scientology. It was very respectable to serve in it. You're like kind of expected to. It's mainly young people. But during the 1970s, he actually faced a bunch of legal threats. French prosecutors charged him and the French Church of Scientology with fraud and customs violations. So when he was faced with possible indictment, he actually ended up going into hiding in the United States in 1979. First, he hid in an apartment in Hemet, California, and his only contact with the world at this time was through trusted messengers. So he was like sketching out. He cut contact with everyone, including his own wife, who he last saw in 1979. Never saw her again. And then in 1979, there was an FBI raid operation called Operation Snow White, and 11 senior people within the church ended up getting convicted of obstructing justice, burglary of government offices, and theft of documents and government property. And the whole operation was to expose a conspiracy within the church to basically cover up things for L. Ron Hubbard. They had a bunch of infiltrations. He ran into a lot of legal trouble and became pretty paranoid. But anyway, Scientology was still moving forward as a religion, and they ended up opening something called the Celebrity Center in Hollywood in the late 60s. And they ended up with other centers in New York, Las Vegas, Nashville, and international outposts in cities such as Paris, London, Munich, and Florence. And one of the things that Scientology is all about is getting a celebrity persona. That's how they like spread the message is getting elite cool celebrities to be part of it. And there are quite a few. Some of the most well-known Scientologists include Tom Cruise, Christy Alley, John Travolta, Isaac Hayes, and a few others. I'm part of a frontier in a way, you know, that, that very few people ever get to be part of. It's a sinister brainwashing cult. Would you ever sit with a Jew and tell them that their religion was a cult? People say that it's a sinister brainwashing cult. What would you say to them? I know. Some people have also said that women are really stupid and shouldn't vote. Do I look brainwashed to you? How dare you? I think it's a privilege to call yourself a Scientologist, and it's something that you have to earn. And because a Scientologist does, he or she has the ability to create new and better realities and improve conditions. The church's spiritual headquarters is located in Clearwater, Florida, which I actually have some vlog footage Josh took when he was there, I'll put in here. A lot of them right here, guys. Here's their building. They're everywhere here, dude. This everywhere. Scientologists are everywhere. Yeah, because this is another, this is probably where they live right here. In this building. Uh, they have like dorms. Yeah. There was so much investigation going into the Church of Scientology, and there was this huge war between them and the government about tax exemption status because most religions, or all religions that are recognized by the government, get to not pay taxes because they're a religion. And L. Ron Hubbard and the Scientologists wanted to be included in this and not be taxed. And in 1993, Scientology officially got their tax exemption status, and it was like a huge celebration for them. 
Um, and according to the official Church of Scientology website, there are now more than 11,000 churches, missions, and groups in 184 nations. And the movement brings in more than 4.4 million people every year. But a lot of scholars and critics of the church and people who research it say that they are really overdoing those numbers, exaggerating them, which probably. Now let's talk a little bit more about the C organization because I feel like I went through it really fast. Not all Scientologists are part of the Sea Org, but like the most dedicated ones are. And the Sea Org is kind of a mixture of military style and corporate management style. And the people that work on the Sea Org live in army-like conditions. They get like boot camp style punishments and training. And you know what's crazy is when a Scientologist joins the Sea Org, they have to sign a one billion year contract. That's right, guys. 1 billion years. And that is because Scientologists believe in reincarnation. So they expect you to serve for all of your lives. And when you're part of the Sea Org, you're just doing a ton of work. Everything from cleaning the churches, to fundraising, to delivering auditing service, to investigating critics, cooking, and executive management. And ex-Sea Org members say that they were continually forced to work 20 hours a day with no pay, just for a place to sleep. But they did get a weekly allowance of 50 bucks. All the Sea Org members members live together, work together, eat together, do everything together. And when you try to leave, they will blackmail you. They will tell you that you owe tons of money. You will be billed actually for all this training in the Sea Org that since you didn't complete it, you are now billed for. So people can't leave. Like you are really stuck in it. Tons of people feel like they're stuck in Scientology. Now, this would not be a Scientology video if we didn't talk about the current leader of the church, David Miscavige. On January 24th of 1986, L. Ron Hubbard actually died of a stroke. And this is when a man named David Miscavige emerged as the new head of the organization. Welcome to church. See if you can explain to me why I would want to be a Scientologist. Because you care about yourself and life itself. Scientology, the word means study of life, study of knowledge. Uh, and that's what it is. It takes up all areas of life itself. Uh, things that are integral and uh, maxims that are related to life and very existence. Uh, let me give you an example. It's better if I take that because it is such a broad ranging subject covering so many different areas. The subject of communication. This is something that uh, major breakthroughs exist in Scientology. Being able to communicate uh, around, in the world around you. And I think everybody would agree that this is an important subject. Uh, so far in life I haven't had a whole lot of trouble communicating. Now see if you can communicate to me what it is that you're going to be able to do for me that makes me a better communicator. Well, I don't, in Scientology, you don't do anything for somebody else. Scientology is something that requires somebody's active participation. Then, fine. And I, certainly, let me I explain wanna, something. I want to participate. I want to be active. Okay, clearly, what, in your life, that, what in your life do you not feel is right that I you would feel, like handled? I feel perfectly comfortable with my life. I like my job. I'm happy with my family. I love my wife. Uh, I'm healthy. Uh, I'm, I'm perfectly content. That's why I'm asking you, what well, is it you can do for me? If you look out across the world today, uh, you could say that if you take a person who's healthy, doing well, like yourself, uh, you, you'd say that that person is normal, not a crazy, not somebody who's a psychotic. You look at a wall and they call it an elephant. Would you agree with me on that? So far, I got no Okay, problem. and you can see people below that. All past attempts have been to bring man up to somebody's standard of what's normal. What we're trying to do in Scientology is take somebody from this higher level and move them up to greater ability. You see, we're interested in... What, what, the, about, those, what about those folks down there? Well, yes, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, we don't ignore them, but my point is this. Scientology is there to help the able become more able. And he is surrounded in controversy, okay? First, his own father published a really damning book called Ruthless, Scientology and My Son David Miscavige. David was actually introduced to the church as a child and he left high school at the age of 16 with his father's permission to join the Sea Org. He wound up working directly with Ron. And by age 19, he was leading the Commodore Messenger organization, which is basically a team that investigates people and finds out dirt on people people in the church. And when L. Ron Hubbard passed away, David Miscavige took over for him. Now one of the most like 
talked about controversies about Scientology is something called The Hole. And according to Lee Remney, who I mentioned earlier, who she wrote that book and she's done a bunch of TV stuff exposing Scientology and helping people who have been trapped in it. And according to her, The Hole is a work camp where troubled members of the church are detained and rewired. So that sounds like some really cult-like shit. Of course, the church completely denies the existence of the whole. However, many former Scientologists have spoken about this, including the former church spokesman Mike Rinder. And one other thing about David that is so beyond weird, I've literally thought about making a video on just this alone. David's wife, after a while, just disappeared and is nowhere to be found. This is Michelle, or Shelly Miscavige, and she was one a very public figure in the Church of Scientology, but she mysteriously disappeared in 2006. Former church members have claimed that Shelly disappeared after she filled several job vacancies without her husband's permission, and her current status is unknown. According to news.com.au, Shelly was spotted entering a hardware store in California near the church headquarters, and apparently she was looking really thin, frail, and disheveled, and was with two men who were hurrying her along. That's same news outlet reported that she was seen again in that same town in 2016, but no one really knows. David has been accused of physical and mental abuse. Multiple ex-members have come forward and said David is just a really mean guy. And they allege that he has attacked them on numerous occasions. And even though the church denies this, David's own father, who wrote that book about him, says that it's true. And David had a very close relationship with Scientology cover boy, Tom Cruise who has really been the face of Scientology. Like from an early point, David realized that he could really use Tom Cruise as a tool in Scientology. So he became all buddy buddy with him, really tried to impress him because it really helped share the message with the public. And Tom Cruise is like really good friends with this guy. The most dedicated Scientologist I know. I have never met a more competent, a more intelligent, a more tolerant, a more compassionate being. We are lucky to have you and thank you very much. <laughs> Debbie Cook has testified in court that she saw Miss Cabbage punch a fellow Scientology executive. He punched him in the face? Yes. I've never seen anything like this before. He says Miss Cabbage never hit thank her. You. She uh, did testify that he ordered his secretary to do so. And she did it. And she did it very hard, yes. Hard enough that you fell down? Yes. Why did he ask her to do this? You know, he was displeased about how I was answering a question, wasn't what he wanted to hear in, in some way. The church is known for denying everything about them and people criticize them for removing negative stuff about them online. They will blackmail people, they will spread lies about former members. They have been known for tricking people into donating money. They are known for going after anyone that challenges Scientology or tries to expose it. They will send out lawsuits. They have literally stopped books that try to challenge them or expose them. And the main concern people have is how much money they charge people for very questionable services. I mean, people are spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. These are the awards that I received. She These recently are... showed us trophies she says she received for giving $2.5 million to Scientology charities. All the money she says she'd spent on the church for auditing courses and materials like these. Lee Remini left the Church of Scientology in 2013. She was really in it in the beginning, like very much into Scientology. And then over the years, she started being treated badly by them and eventually left the church. And she is known for exposing the truth about Scientology in her A&E documentary series, Lee Remini, Scientology in the Aftermath. And the church likes to say that she is just creating the series for fame and money, which she doesn't need to. I mean, she was already famous. But she has gone on anyway and has been interviewing people. They are now working on a third season and they're letting people tell their stories of abuse and just what they've gone through in Scientology. And it, it's really amazing what people have been through. And the fact that a lot of them don't have all their family members. Normally it's like one or two family members and they're still missing one or two more who are in the Sea Org or something or are trapped. Marriages are ruined. When they tried to recruit my daughter into the sea organization at a very young age, no. uh, she was nine years old. And I said, she's off limits, you guys, just leave her alone. You can't join the sea org until you're 18, but you can, if your parents are okay with it, you can sign over. And I said, you know something? How long is that contract? A billion years. 
but it took me another five years to get out because the I was so insulated. Dentists, doctors, agents, managers, all were Scientologists, and and you know they of course disconnected with me. They could no longer talk to me. Hi, I'm Chris Shelton. I grew up in the Church of Scientology and worked for the organization for 25 years. People call Scientology a cult, and they're right. It is a cult. But the last people who are ever going to realize that are the Scientologists. I no longer believe that L. Ron Hubbard and David Miscavige are somehow blessed with divine infallibility. I will no longer have to undergo hard labor or rigorous ethics programs because I'm asking too many questions, or because I'm not working hard enough, or because I've demonstrated a lack of faith. I no longer have to listen to anyone telling me how I should think or act or speak. I no longer fear the internet or have to screen out anti-Scientology information in order to protect my immortal soul for all of eternity. I no longer believe that it comes down to us Scientologists versus the rest of the delusional humanoids on this planet. Nor do I have to wonder anymore why people can't see how great Scientology obviously is. I no longer live in fear of leaving the Church of Scientology because of what they might do to me, my family, my job, or my life. We don't have an idea of what's going on in the, in the real world. I don't have a cell phone, I don't have an internet, and I don't have TV. A suppressive person is basically somebody who is bent on doing total destruction. They don't want any good to happen. This connection is a policy whereby if someone is connected to somebody who is a suppressive person or doing something that is considered suppressive, they have to either handle them or if the person won't handle, they're supposed to disconnect from them. And with that, Amy lost all connection with her family. I had been working about one year, nine months, and Christmas was coming up and I wanted to go see family. Now the thing is, when you go to see family, you don't just walk out of the building, you have to write permission. And uh, you give it in, it's a letter. So the first one I handed in, came back disapproved, and they were saying basically I was not being a team member, and essentially what it meant is I had not sold enough of their books. I hadn't made enough money. Hadn't made enough money. So I put in another one because I really didn't want to go. And they came back, disapproved again. They wanted me to set a quota like $500 and then I can go. But we're talking Christmas Eve, Christmas Day now. <clears throat> so I wasn't too happy with that. I missed my dad. I hadn't been home in all of that time. Gave them a letter and it said, I am going, whether you want me to or not, and I printed 10 copies and I gave it in. And that caused a bit of commotion. Uh, they did not like that at all because they expect anybody must get permission before leaving the building. And so they brought me into a room, there was two of them, and they basically interrogated me as to why I really wanted to go. Because apparently wanting to see your family isn't a good enough reason, so I must be up to something if I'm breaking the rules and that interrogation lasted for five hours. And the scariest part, really, was that they were threatening that just for leaving to see my dad would be enough to do the declare on me, to issue that piece of paper that says I'm an evil person. And uh, they were threatening right then and there they would have my dad disconnect from me. I have been out of the Sea Org for about 10 years, nine years since I was declared. Um, actually, eight years since I was declared, nine years since I got out. But we're, we're coming up on a decade now. And for me, I think that I've done a fairly good job of doing my part to share my story and to, to be that person who has the most recent knowledge of what's going on. And since the show, there's been a lot of backlash on Scientology because a lot more people know about it now. A lot of people didn't realize what it was. They just thought it was some weird thing Tom Cruise was in. And now people actually know it's really ruining lives. And of course, they are going to want to fight back. So there is an organization called STAND. And this stands for a Scientist Taking Action Against Discrimination. And the organization is there to protect Scientology as religion against discrimination. And they claim that Lee Remini is irresponsible and spiteful 
full. Since her show aired, she has gotten like 500 threats, including death threats type of stuff. Now, like I said, there is so much more that I could tell you guys about Scientology. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> As you can imagine, it's a huge religion. But that's all I can cram into this video for today. Let me know your guys' thoughts on Scientology. If you've had any experiences with it, let me know if you've ever gone into one of them. If you actually were in Scientology, it's Scientology now, don't be mad at me, but let us know your experience. I'm curious to see what you guys know about it. I always hear different things from different people who have had their experiences talking to people or just going into a building. So let me know. If you guys want to see more videos on religion and like cults and stuff like this, let me know as well by hitting the thumbs up button. And that's it for me today, guys. I hope you're having a good day and I will talk to you next time. Bye.